At the end of June 2021, Lytton, a small town in Western Canada, burned to the ground. In the extraordinary preceding week, a freak atmospheric event had pushed temperatures up to 49.6 degrees C, the highest temperature ever recorded in the country. Just months later, floods and landslides caused by two days of intense rainfall cut off the region's biggest city, Vancouver, from the rest of Canada, leading to the loss of at least five lives and costing the Canadian economy billions of dollars. I'm Dr. Doug McNeil. And I'm Dr. Rosie Oakes. Welcome to Mostly Climate. In this episode of Mostly Climate, we're talking about a year of extremes for Canada, a country on the front lines of climate change. Today, we discuss 2021, the year of weather extremes that brought Canada to its knees, and we're joined by Environment Canada meteorologist Armel Castellan. Armel lives and works in British Columbia, Canada, and he's a friend and regular contributor to our sister podcast, WeatherSnap. Armel, welcome to the show, and thanks so much for talking to us. Could you tell us about where exactly you work and what you do? Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure. Um, I actually work on the unceded territory of Lekwungen-speaking peoples, uh, the First Nations known as the Songhees and Esquimalt, also known as Victoria, BC. So actually it's far away from the region of the Arctic that you can get in Canada, and yet it's uh, one of my areas of focus. I look at anomalous trends and report to emergency management, whether it's in the Arctic, uh, little hamlets of 80 wintertime residents, or down to you know the big metropolis of Vancouver on the south coast of BC. And it's about kind of looking in that medium term, looking out a week, two weeks away, looking at events as they start barreling towards you, whether it's a heat wave of larger proportions, an atmospheric river, uh, you know, all of the nuances in between and allowing those decision makers advance notice. That's really kind of that magic spot where you can really help society out. So this is a vast area that you're looking over. Can you talk to us about the climate of that area and the geography of that area? It sounds like it's hugely varied. It's absolutely enormous. It makes up 50% of the landmass of Canada, three territories, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. And yet, you know, less than 1% of our population lives up there. But the Inuvialuit are tremendous peoples. They've really been dealing with what we now are starting to see very much across the globe, you know, climate change impacts. They've been dealing with this for decades. I've had the fortune of traveling to the Arctic and engaging, collaborating with some of these hamlets. And it's amazing to me the changes that we've seen even in the last few years, let alone the last few decades. Uh, even this year in 2021, October saw such an anomalous trend. It was you know, 15, 20 degrees Celsius warmer than normal. That type of anomaly was so strong that everybody from both ends of the Arctic noticed the slow start to winter. The sea ice was just not forming, and that caused tremendous anxiety, not so much because they couldn't get on the ice yet, but knowing what the implications are to their quote-unquote country food. So the migration of animals is tremendously affected by such a strong or delayed sea ice start. You said you go up and visit these people in the areas where they're living. When we're working with populations internationally, we do try and talk to them about their local knowledge and how that affects how they're responding to weather and climate information that we're providing them. So how does this work when you're out in the areas that you've discussed? How are they receiving the information that you're giving them and how do they interpret that in the context of their Indigenous understanding? It is nuanced because we have a history of colonialism in Canada and I represent the federal government. So the first times that I went up to the north, it was met with essentially silence. It was just, who is this fellow? He's male, he's white. What are you doing here? And of course, I had yeah. the fortune of going up there with academia and with people who had relationships previous. So it really took until that second and third time before I was met with a little bit of trust. And once you start establishing that trust, that's when the real stories start to come out and you don't have to engage the same kind of formal way. And you know, people would take me out 
ice fishing and show me their local, you know, char fishing holes and explain to me some of their stories. And it's exactly how you phrased it. There's the traditional knowledge, the knowledge that has given them, you know, survival for millennia. And yet in the last few decades, there is a huge disconnect between the elders that have hunted and fished for many years to today's hunters and trappers, and they are not seeing the same landscape their elders have. So not only are they respecting their elders and using that traditional knowledge, but also having to mix into it a healthy dose of modern science in order to keep that survival going. And that's kind of where we're trying to place ourselves as a user-led weather services and ice for locals in places that are so disparate, so remote, uh, so vulnerable, and then trying to find that kind of secret sauce to give them exactly what they need. You mentioned uh, impacts on ecosystems and on sea ice. Can you tell us the changes that people are seeing due to climate change in the Arctic at the moment and how they're impacting those indigenous communities? They're so varied and so big. It's such an enormous area. We're looking at a sea ice season that is much shorter on both ends. And it's not just by a few days, climatologically speaking, it's by several weeks. You expand your open water season, you're shrinking your, your sea ice season. So the impacts on you know, polar bears and seals during the ice season is obviously affected. Um, and then you start to think about the Gaia hypothesis, where if your open water season is longer, you've got a larger fetch for now a windier regime to affect larger bodies of open water. So now we're looking at erosion on certain communities. Some storms take out meters and meters of coastline in one storm. So at a scale of a year, or at least of you know the seven months of open water, you're starting to look at a changing geophysical landscape. And of course, the implications on the animal flora and the fauna in particular is, is tremendous. So caribou migration, muskox, all of the big game that really sustain these people is hugely affected. You can also think about the storage of the food used to be in large quantities done inside the permafrost. That is the community freezer, if you will. Now, permafrost in some locations is starting to fail. They're too dangerous to go into and to have that cold storage. What's starting to happen are implications on what they need locally. They have higher fuel consumption in order to create the electricity to sustain the big chest freezers that they're now obliged to host uh, in their community. So it's so varied how the temperature sounds so innocuous and simple will affect a community. Another example that's not at this time of year, but uh, in June, July, at the start of so-called summer in the Arctic, is when they've caught a whole bunch of fish and they're drying their fish. They call it dry fish. But now, instead of having you know wasps and mosquitoes arrive in those northern latitudes, they're dealing with a multitude of insects they've never seen before. And instead of lasting three weeks of summer, it's lasting three months. And they're dealing with you know larvae on those dry fish. And I speak of it from obviously a neophytic level. I mean, I don't need to do this myself the same way, but I appreciate their concerns because food, as I found out, was extraordinarily expensive and not fresh. You know, it arrives already damaged in these locations. It's flown in, it goes through, you know, seven different flights to get there. You show up and you can't believe that one processed meal will cost you $18. And it's something that you might find in a Canadian grocery store in the South for three or $4 in the South. So I guess what I'm trying to say there is the, uh, the country food, what they catch, what they harvest is upwards of 40, 50% of their diet. And that is starting to become uh, very difficult to sustain. What's come up there for me is that these populations are having to adapt to this new climatic regime that they're facing. And this is something that we've talked about in previous podcasts, you know, mitigating against climate change is one thing, but the climate is already changing and populations are being forced to adapt. It sounds like for these populations, it's quite hard to adapt because if your permafrost melts and that's all you've ever used to refrigerate your food, then like you say, the costs start getting quite high. So have there been a lot of conversations about adaptation uh, when you've met with these peoples? You know, what's amazing about the interactions and the collaborations we have there is how matter of fact and in the present they are. You know, we can 
talk about RCP 8.5 and what that means, their implication, their cause and effect of climate change is so infinitesimally small. So this is being thrust upon them, just like colonialism, just like lots of other things. You have to appreciate how resilient a folk you, you need to be in order to live in that kind of environment, both geopolitically as well as environmentally. And so, yeah, I would, I would say that adaptation is the, the only way forward. You know, when they start looking at thunder and lightning, they've never seen in places upwards of, you know, 73 degrees north. This is a new phenomenon. So they have to figure out how are they going to get their ATVs from getting stuck in the mud because they've never seen mud to that extent or rivers swollen to that level uh, in order to find their eider ducks or what have you. So yeah, humbling to behold, I have to say. At this point, there are some limits to adaptation. Have you got people that are, are uniquely vulnerable to climate change here? Are there limits to where they can ad- or how they can adapt? Yeah, absolutely there are. I mean, we can talk about you know climate refugees and it's not just atolls in the South Pacific, right? It's also on our Canadian landscape. There are places that are becoming less hospitable for life whether it's, you know, because of wildfire and heat regimes or because your location is actually being washed into the sea. So Tukta Yaktuk is the perfect example of a location that has um, been threatened with erosion, as I was mentioning earlier, and they're having to very realistically decide on how they're going to relocate in the coming years and not 50 years from now, but in the next, you know, five or 10 years is the big need to consider what that looks like. You know, there's a road called the Dempster. It goes from Dawson City to Inuvik. And in fact, it's been extended from Inuvik to Taktayaktak. That piece of road is an unbelievable tundra landscape, but it's built on permafrost. And that road is going to need an increasing, like an exponentially increasing maintenance budget in order to keep it drivable because of how the landscape below the road is changing. So there are, yeah, there are big dollars and cents reasons to consider, you know, where you are, how many subsidies you're dealing with. Another enormous piece of what it is to live in the North is being subject to one sea lift. So shipping of goods. So if it's a prefab home, it's your ATVs, it's your freezers, it's all the dry food that you're going to eat for essentially an entire year. And that needs to come in in one operation. And that's very tricky. We speak to the marine industry for the open water season in order to maximize the potential for that to be successful. Because if it isn't, either you have a spill right on the landscape because they're dealing with you know, unpredictable winds and they have to jettison a fuel line uh, that's stretched over one and a half kilometers sometimes. It's so raw. And yet the implications of how events like the sea lift will sometimes not work out. And that's probably just a more and more difficult proposition as we go forward in time. I know it's it's impossible to speak for a community, but can you give me an idea about how people feel about the changing climate and the fact you mentioned before, you know, they bear such little responsibility and yet are really feeling the impacts more than most other populations in in the world. How do people express this to you? I think there's an overlying sadness At the end of the day, if somebody wants to see the success of, you know, how they're resilient and moving forward, measured in how few suicides they have in the community, I think that says a lot about the struggle and the sadness and overlaying on top of that, what, you know, the the coming decades look like. Yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge. And what, what's so impressive is that so many people, I feel, especially Northerners, uh, hold hope knowing that adaptation of their uh, of their climate and you know how they move forward in that frame of mind. You've talked before about how big your patch is so as well as the Canadian Arctic you also covered some other pretty large weather events last year in your patch so can you talk to us uh, a bit more about some of the other extreme events that you saw last year in your area? There was international news as early as February of last year when the cold reached south and in fact all the way into Texas and the United States. That event alone was a strong cold, you know, not always associated with climate change going towards warmer and warmer climates. But what we're seeing are extremes even in those cold temperatures. Even just last week, we saw minus 74 
degrees in northern Canada uh, with the wind chill. So numbers that have actually some places never been seen before. And so, yeah, on both ends of kind of last winter and this winter, we're seeing some very cold conditions. And then really, you know, from those uh, early 2021 days, we went into essentially a drought. It was a drought for Western Canada, including the prairies. We saw very little precipitation from March onward. And that's kind of part of the precursor to what happened in late June. Late June is the solstice. And the solstice is not normally when we actually have our warmest temperatures. They're always delayed until late July into August. And by association, the wildfire season as well. But lo and behold, we felt we could see a ridge of high pressure, essentially kind of a lid on the atmosphere, keeping things very stagnant. And those are the kinds of things that we're actually incredibly good at forecasting. And that's what's ironic about the whole condition is that we knew and we talked about it and we knew about 2003 in Western Europe and how impactful that heat event was, particularly elderly and the vulnerable. It's not like we don't have epidemiologists. We have all of those things. We just still managed to see this heat come, you know, 10 days out, live through it and also die through it. And it, in fact, it ended up being the most deadly weather event in Canadian history over those, you know, five, six days in late June. The temperatures that we were hearing about were nothing like you've ever imagined for Canada before. But you're saying as a weather forecaster, you saw them coming. So how did you deal with that in terms of you had a pretty good idea of maybe what the impacts would be and what was the pressure on you to get that communication out to people? I think it's a, a communications um, disconnect more than it is an atmospheric science one in the sense that we have understood way back in 2003, how this is like 20 years ago, an event that really put heat on the world meteorological organization level, all meteorological services are aware of it. Scientists of, you know, dealing in the health spectrum are really working towards making this an understood thing, especially with the trend that we're on, you know, heat events in particular seem to be uh, more frequent, higher amplitude, and even longer lasting. So Instead of a two-day wonder where it gets hot, it gets uncomfortable, but you get respite soon after. This was an event that uh, looked like a you know, multi-day event. In fact, it ended up being close to a week at those thresholds, close to 800 deaths uh, happening over that period of time. And what's you know, extra interesting from a meteorological point of view is that the peak heat happens you know, on, say, June 27th, 28th, 29th, but the peak fatalities are happening, you know, up to four days after that. That's one reason why in collaboration with the health authorities, we kept our heat alerts or heat warnings out longer than we would have normally done so because the temperatures overnight were starting to cool, the daytime temperatures were starting to cool, but we knew the impact was still there. And we wanted absolutely for everybody to think about who they know, who lives alone, that doesn't have air conditioning, and this is another great point. Not only was this happening near the solstice, it was happening in a place that has Mother Nature's air conditioning, the Pacific Ocean. So we don't normally go to 40 degrees in the Fraser Valley right next to Vancouver, never been seen before, right? Not only for one temperature maximum for a day, but sequentially seeing what was a lot talked about is the national record for maximum temperature in Saskatchewan way back you know, 80 years ago. 45 degrees. So we saw Lytton um, see that record blown apart three days in a row. And not only Lytton, it wasn't just one spot. It was also Cash Creek, Ashcroft, Lillooet. Armel, you mentioned the 2003 heat wave in uh, Europe. And this was just when I started my PhD, it made a really big impact on me and uh, especially how vulnerable certain groups were. I know that afterwards in Europe, for example, in France, there were huge changes in culture almost, in terms of uh, people taking holidays at different times, uh, people checking on the vulnerable elderly, which meant that in subsequent heat waves, there were fewer deaths. What are the lessons that Canada has learned about this heat wave that might be applied in other cities or in other regions? There's so many lessons to learn, and we do hold a lot of hope because of the Western European example where subsequent heat has actually been 
stronger, longer lasting, and yet hasn't caused the same kind of morbidity in, in the population. And the lessons are varied. One is certainly a communications exercise where we need to reach more people. Sadly, you need an event like this in order to show how devastating heat can be. Um, and I think everybody globally and certainly Canadian provinces and territories were paying attention to this event because we've had smaller events in 2018 in Quebec, 2009 in Vancouver was a much smaller event, but, you know, kind of started to put it on the map. This was blowing it out of the water. And in fact, climate projections didn't have this event, not for another couple decades. And so that's the other piece is how are we going to now move in a direction where the population is more resilient. And part of that is identifying that things like misting stations and keeping libraries and malls open later into the evening so that people can find respite, it helps, but it is not a silver bullet. And we understand that. We know that this has actually a lot to do with people living in conditions and not being aware of their own frailty in a multi-day event like this. And it comes down to very specific population groups uh, that are vulnerable. So for instance, and I found this fascinating because it's not my area of study, people with Alzheimer's have a lot of eyes on them. They need those eyes regardless of heat. So they're actually hugely resilient because they're people watching out for dementia and the Alzheimer's patients. People who are substance users, people who are schizophrenic can lead some fairly independent lives, can live alone and therefore are the group that was most targeted by this event. So there's a lot of work to do with the social ministries in order to get that kind of grassroots movement ahead of an event like this, to get those eyes out there, to show that people care, that society cares, that you are going to figure a way. You know, I had the benefit of being able to pitch my tent in my backyard and sleep outside. And that was, you know, what got me through the event uh, as well as my family. Other people don't necessarily live in a place where they can put a tent in their backyard. And that's the difference. We need to find a solution that works for everybody down to essentially the, the most vulnerable populations. And I think it's an awareness thing. And I think as a result of this event, we're actually going in a direction to have a two-tiered heat alert system. So yes, there's going to be those routine events, probably a few every given summer in every given location. They're going to be uncomfortable, but they might last a couple of days of, you know, those threshold amounts of peaks of temperatures, but that'll be not it because we will see, you know, half a dozen people die from heat from those events, but then it's a whole other level to get to a tier two where we are going to be calling it a heat emergency. And that's when we really need all hands on deck and for everybody in society to kind of really pay attention to their elders, to those who are frail and those who are vulnerable. Sounds like there's already been a lot of learning from the event. Like you say, you've managed to identify these vulnerable populations. And it sounds like those learnings are things that could be learned from worldwide. So although Canada was the one impacted by this extreme temperature this summer, you know, as Doug mentioned, it could be Europe. And so it sounds like sharing these learnings globally is really important. And I think one really key thing that you picked up on is the need to integrate social scientists and people with different disciplines to solve this climate challenge. And this is something that we've talked about increasingly on this podcast, that climate science isn't about scientists on their own anymore. It's got to be about talking to the population and getting those skilled professionals in from the different disciplines to help us not only work out what is happening, but how we get that to people and how people make decisions and how action happens as well. Yeah, we found uh, the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, which we refer to hot Canada because there's so many similarities between <laughs> our Commonwealth countries. And, you know, they were very interested to hear about the heat event. I mean, they, they asked me about it in late November. So we had to talk about flooding as well, which, you know, they're, they're not immune from. But, uh, you know, between the international media that came in and it was a huge surge, something like 50 requests per day for you know days on end and and it really didn't stop with just the heat because any meteorologist that knows about heat and big ridges of very high pressure knows that there is a ridge breakdown on the far end of that event and a ridge breakdown is more bread and butter in that it is going to be when 
we get lots of dry lightning because there's just so much dryness at the surface. You know, even if it's a weak cold front could generate tens if not hundreds of thousands of lightning bolts. And that's when you start to see, you know, a rapid escalation of the wildfire season. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And we were just on a marathon pace to be briefing emergency management from a record deadly heat event into you know, urban and wildfire marathon into August. And uh, yeah, you had to catch your breath in there somewhere. This is an extraordinary compound event. So you've had a region which has just had a huge stress on it due to this heat wave. And now inevitably you have fire ignition and wildfires. Can you talk about the extent and the impacts of those wildfires? We saw that Lytton uh, was severely affected, but was this a wider problem? The short answer is yes, it was a wide problem. It is complex again, because you have a landscape that's enormous. I mean, British Columbia alone, I believe you can fit Japan six times in our province. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many times the UK fits, but it, it's many times. It's, it's a, a huge <laughs> landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, we are a resource country, you know, natural resources is a part of, you know, how Canada's economy works. We've been managing our forests, particularly in BC, which is heavily forested with mountainous landscapes for decades and decades. And so that's not an insignificant role. But when we look at how the wildfire signal has evolved in the last couple of decades, we can see three in the last five years, our record-breaking hectares burnt. So 2017, 2018 would have also been in the international news. And then two years of hiatus, more or less, with a 2021 in third place. So yeah, not only was Lytton burnt down to the ground, 90% of the town wiped off. You're also looking at a very early start. It's so precocious to start fires in June. They normally don't start until late July. And then we, we have a strong wildfire season that lasts until sometimes into early September. But to have it start in June just meant that all those fine fuels, the built up index, the drought moisture codes were all on one end of the spectrum. And you're dealing with interface fires, infrastructure, so highways and internet cables that are buried underground. All those things are at play. And you're at the same time evacuating tens of thousands of people almost per day in all these different various locations and repositioning assets. It's a huge endeavor to just keep the assets at bay, let alone the, the value of the timber. That, that's very much secondary to when these enormous outbreaks occur. It's just about people's safety and then some of the infrastructure, if you can, save it. And then we, we lick our wounds at the end of the day. It sounds like the heat waves were more deadly and dangerous than the wildfires. Is that always the case? Was that just because the heat wave was so extreme? Generally speaking, we don't have too many deaths associated with wildfires. They can travel at extraordinary speeds, well faster than anybody can run. Sometimes even somebody can drive. Um, but, you know, I, I believe there was only one death in Lytton, which is tragic in and of itself. But beyond that, I don't know that there was more than maybe one other all summer. And that's fairly typical. We don't deal in dozens, if not hundreds of deaths from wildfires. They are menacing, but they are somewhat manageable. I mean, we have air resources. There's usually, this is what's interesting as well, there's usually several ways around all these different valley and mountain communities. Uh, so if there's not one way out, there's another way out. And that's usually it's saving grace. So Yes, we're dealing with heat and the aftermath of heat and all those fatalities. And then we're dealing with wildfire uh, and the infrastructure concerns, but also health, because as you can probably guess, there's a lot of smoke, so much smoke, in fact, that the levels of fine particulate, what we call particulate matter 2.5 micron, is at concentrations of six, 700 micrograms per cubic meter, which is to say you can't see the house down the street you can't breathe without feeling a bit of that sting. Um, it didn't affect the major metropolitan centers. It was mostly kept in the interior and then moved into the rest of Canada. So that epidemiology and the research behind how smoke alone, forget about the wildfires, just smoke alone, how it affects a place like Toronto, which is like thousands of kilometers away, is very much tangible. You can quantify if you, expose that size of a population 
to even 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So a, a modest amount, but for several days or a couple of weeks, that economically speaking is an enormous amount because it rises hospitalizations, asthma costs, you know, shortens people's lives. The intertidal zone on the BC coast was exposed to this heat as well. And they're measuring the bivalves and all those goopy animals, several billion affected and died through this heat. And that's the natural side of things. The farming, uh, fish farming, so oysters, uh, those type of animals are also hugely affected throughout this event. But there are things that we don't necessarily think about as meteorologists, which is not surprising because we look at the sky and we think about models. But railway tracks are also susceptible to uh, changes in, in heat. So that gradient is so strong, you are affecting the economy the port of Vancouver, which is our biggest port, uh, the rail lines coming to it, uh, the infrastructure that was affected by buckling roads, you know, windshields that were cracking in this kind of 50 degree heat uh, was just astounding to hear about. So yeah, not only that, and it was COVID, we had COVID vaccination centers having to close because the public transit and the conditions in these arenas uh, were just not susceptible to, to healthy environments. So we had to put a pause on uh, vaccinations during that time as well. Okay, so after a summer of heat waves and wildfires, it sounds like, you know, maybe you've had enough extreme events for one year, but it didn't stop there. Uh, can, can you tell us what happened next? Tell us about the floods. Well, the floods were something that I would never have guessed I would see in my career. It was an event that is almost as incredible as the heat event in that it's likely the most costly event that's weather related in Canadian history. And it came on the heels of a very interesting couple of months. So not only did we go from a drought signal from March through to August, but we, we essentially flipped a switch on the 17th of September I remember because it was an early atmospheric river. And of course, it's a term now that's being used very widely, but atmospheric scientists have been using it for, you know, since the nineties. And even before that, we talked about moist conveyor belts of uh, moisture and so on. But the first one occurred on the 17th of September. And we thought, wow, that's a, that's a doozy. That is a lot of water early in the season. How is that going to affect, you know, this drought stricken, uh, landscape. So kind of the cards were in front of us. And we went from that event to another, to another, to another. And we had, uh, you know, the wettest September on record for some locations, October as well. And then the start of November was extraordinarily wet as well. So we went from dry to wet. And we had some locations that not only did they see a wettest month on record, but they actually saw the wettest season on record when we look at meteorological fall, September, October, November. Uh, so that is a big piece of what happened on the 13th of November. We had also just gotten uh, the start of our snowpack. So yeah, we're in the mountains here. We look up, we have mountains that you know stretch up to you know, 1,500, 2,000 meters. And they are starting to cover in a blanket of snow, which is exciting. It means winter is coming. But the difference between snow that is 50 centimeters thick versus several meters is that when it's thinner, it cannot absorb an atmospheric river of the proportion that we saw on the 13th through the 15th of November. It becomes isothermal, meaning it's the same temperature as it warms up, and then you dump on it 250, 300 millimeters of water, it is pretty much all going to melt. So not only do you have 300 millimeters of rain over 48 hours, but you also have 100 more millimeters of snow that you're adding to uh, the hydrology. And then you have yourself an overwhelmed system from a flooding perspective. You also have, as we spoke about earlier, all these burn scars in the interior that are now change that landscape, it becomes hydrophobic, which is a fancy way of saying that it can no longer absorb water the same way as it did before. So we had debris flows, landslides, mudslides along three or four of our hugest highways that connect Greater Vancouver, uh, the Lower Mainland, as we call it, to the rest of Canada. And there were deaths on those highways. I think there's five or six reported deaths on the highway towards Pemberton, 
Lytton was affected by these landslides as well. Um, this moisture plume was so strong, in fact, not only did it affect the coast, which it traditionally does, but it also pushed into the coastal mountains, the North Cascadia Mountains, both on the Washington State side and the BC side, and into the crest of our coastal mountains, and bringing so much water to watersheds that you don't typically see that kind of surge, and overwhelming you know, water treatment plants, evacuating Merritt is seven, 8,000 people. Princeton also dealing with the Tulamine River in their neck of the woods, overwhelmed and big parts of their city evacuated. So the implications of that event brought back what is a lake to the lower mainland, the Sumas Prairie, back to its lake form, even though there are levees, um, dikes that are protecting that hugely rich agricultural land from becoming a lake again. But, you know, Mother Nature will have its way. There will be breaches in that infrastructure. Our Fraser River is our biggest river in BC. It has multiple millions of salmon run through it every year. Normally, what we talk about is the freshet in the spring when the snow is ready to melt at the end of kind of middle of spring, end of winter, and eventually gets warm enough. And then all that snow eventually melts when it gets warm enough. And that's when we usually have our biggest surges in the big river systems. In this event, we saw a higher surge in the Fraser River than we have ever seen any time of year. It was a polar opposite time of year for this event to happen. Um, you know, it was a confluence of factors, the precursor, the antecedent conditions of the dryness ahead of it, the wildfires, uh, the thin snowpack, the fact that it had been repeatedly wet all through the fall. So when you have a saturated soil, you can't absorb anything more to it. That is just an extraordinary amount of rain. So you said 250 to 300 millimeters of rain fell. So just for context for our UK listeners, in London, the average rainfall is 40 to 60 millimeters a month. And if you live in rainy old Manchester, it's 60 to 80 millimeters a month. So that is five times more rain fell in that event than falls in the UK in a whole month. So the numbers that we're talking about are just absolutely massive here. Even for our West Coast, and sometimes we dub it the wet coast, even by those standards, places like Tofino on the outside coast of Vancouver Island will see many hundreds of millimeters in the peak of the wet season. And November is that month. It's the month that statistically gives us the most amount of rain. Uh, it's when the Pacific is so active. It's usually just a parade of storms, one after the other. And in those 48 hours, uh, not only did we see daily records, many, many dozens of those, but some of those records in 24 hours were all-time 24-hour records. So Hope in the eastern part of the Fraser Valley saw 174 millimeters in 24 hours. And that is just a 24-hour record bar none for that area. And it is equivalent essentially to November as a month worth of precipitation in those 48 hours. So yeah, 250 millimeters, 300 in some locations, and adding probably closer to 100, if not 150 millimeters in some locations from the snowmelt means a surge that uh, is, is hard to quantify. And that's where, yeah, things like an attribution study really start to kind of peel away the curtain behind what does this mean for our climate uh, from yesteryear and what does it look like going forward? I was going to say, Omar, you, you brought up the, the attribution study. So these events, both the heat wave and the flooding, are so large that drawing conclusions about how they might be caused by climate change has got to be at least worth a look. And my understanding is that both of these events now have had formal attributions, or at least there are formal attribution attempts that are going on in the literature and at speed. I'm really interested in what's causing these. What are the driving mechanisms? You mentioned the atmospheric river. We've heard about the heat dome um, in Lytton. What's causing these, what's driving these, and how is climate change affecting them? And how do we know? So tell me about the study that you've been involved with in these floods and what you found. Yeah, we just released a study a couple of days ago, and it's groundbreaking in the sense that it happens so quickly after an event. You know, usually these are very academic exercises and will take usually many more months, if not years, to kind of tease out those type of uh, calculations. And really, 
the idea of an attribution study is to run a simulation of the event that transpired with the conditions, the initializations of the conditions of a pre-industrialized climate, and then run it several times as well in the conditions of today and perhaps even of tomorrow and the and you know years from now to get a sense of what changes statistically speaking the event may have had on what it would have looked like you know 100 years ago and and also what's going to happen in the next few years and the results are in a sense surprising and unsurprising you know the fact that human influence has had an increase in the probability of atmospheric river events of say 60% is a quite a large number when you think about you know where we've been you know even myself used to think that you know these events would have to be heat or cold related in order to see that kind of fingerprint but now we're starting to see these events these individual events you know have to be large enough scale in order to uh, model them to this extent and that probability of you know resulting precipitation at that intensity right so it's about intensity at the peak seeing those 20 millimeters an hour which is kind of tropical and in fact an atmospheric river by definition stems from the tropics we call them pineapple expresses because they stem from hawaii direction so there's a lot of moisture there that needs to balance itself out between the equators and the poles and we know other certainties about atmospheric rivers we know that the uh, ability for the atmosphere to retain moisture increases as the temperature increases that's just physics so not only do you have a baseline that's moved and in a lot of way the similarities between the heat dome and the atmospheric river are similar those attributions are saying here's your baseline with temperature there's now you know 1.2 degrees above where they used to be and for canada it's higher than that because we're climbing at you know double if not triple or quadruple for the arctic the speed of the rest of the globe every given year so we're seeing that event transpire for heat we're seeing the same thing for atmospheric rivers where we are dealing with a stronger caliber so yeah the event itself was perhaps a one in a 10 year event and of course the kinds of infrastructure that we overlay on top of it i mean do we build on flood plains you know the calgary floods of 2013 are a great example of what happens when you start to encroach on a natural landscape that doesn't have that mitigated power to uh, adapt itself and therefore you know you put your house on a flood plain well you won't be surprised um so yeah to see the probabilities of 60% come out of this study really put that terrifying notion uh in any atmospheric scientist because what we know is that this was actually not the worst case event we know that going forward we're going to see atmospheric rivers that are potentially double if not triple the potency we talk about integrated vapor transport as they move towards us and then we also talk about how long might they last and if the mechanics or the patterns of the atmosphere yield us atmospheric rivers that not only stay for 36 those 48 hour events that are obviously impactful in and of themselves but looking deeper into the forecast with potential events that are lasting for 5 days if not even up to 10 days potentially as we've seen i think there's one or two examples in the literature we may not be talking anymore because we still have to pick up you know the infrastructure the cables the this and the that just to put our society back together for the original building blocks so yeah the study puts a lens on the vulnerabilities that existed you know if you think about the agricultural sector with all the animals that died the blueberries and the raspberries that got baked on the bush during the heat wave all of those things are magnified and you can see that going forward we're dealing with a more difficult situation still and and do we have uh the wherewithal as a society to you know mitigate against it you know cop 26 etc and that adaptation piece on how are we going to build those levees those dikes to be so much stronger that we can still live in an area that mother nature is saying well you may decide that this is a little bit of a tricky spot do you know if there are any short term quick wins i guess adaptation wise that have been put in place in case you have 2022 hopefully not but looking similar to 2021 and what have been put in place kind of long term goals 
either from Environment Canada perspective or from a broader Canadian government perspective? That's a good question. And I, I don't know that I have actually all the answers to it. I know there's a lot of conversations about things that we have, I guess, in our control as a Department of Environment and Climate Change. We are certainly involved in a discussion around a scale, an atmospheric river scale, uh, which would resemble in some ways what we see uh, for the Saffir Simpson hurricane categories or the enhanced Fujita damage scale for tornadoes. So it would be a way to communicate, to socialize what we are seeing. Yes, there are you know, 12 or 20 atmospheric rivers in a given active weather season. Uh, most of them are levels one, two, and every once in a while you kind of peek into three and sometimes four like we saw in November. Now, you know, those, there's still relatively early discussions, but it's something that we're doing in collaboration with emergency management, uh, with the engineering community. So those looking at culverts and overwhelmed systems and the potential for landslides. So that's kind of in the short term forecasting. Are we ready and, you know, are our systems in place for perhaps using uh, different kinds of broadcast intrusive alerting uh, that we haven't traditionally used for flooding? Uh, but we've used for things like tsunami and earthquakes and other types of natural hazards. And as it relates to heat, uh, like I mentioned, there's the two-tiered heat alerting system that we're going to be piloting this coming summer for BC alone. My sense is that that's going to be something that the other provinces uh, and territories are going to look at very closely and see if it's something that everybody really should uh, implement at a national scale. Okay, perhaps we should uh, wrap up here. Armel, this has been amazing. What a really super interesting conversation. I think I've got one last question, I guess. And again, I'm going to make you speak for a population, <laughs> which <laughs> I appreciate is a really hard thing. Um, but this kind, these kind of events are really noticed worldwide. We noticed them here and we heard about them in media. Has it changed the conversation about climate change in Canada are you having more conversations with the general public or with family members about what these things mean and what they might mean for our future and what we might do about them? Doug, that's a great question. And, you know, a new word in my vocabulary this past year is solastalgia. In other words, you know, eco-anxiety and the kinds of emotional roller coaster on a personal level, you know, these events have impacted my, my personal life and, and professionally too. I mean, we talk about it now more holistically uh, across our department and, you know, across social media in, you know, the nerdy spheres that I operate in. And it's really starting to have an impact on the conversations that I have with the media. And, you know, half of my job is speaking with media, uh, traditional and otherwise. And the question is genuine. It used to be like, oh, well, you're kind of on the fringe to talk about climate change on a program and you know what can we possibly say but now it's like we are starting to see events that have their fingerprint all over them uh, that are affecting populated zones in the south of Canada not just in the extreme north where so few people live and it's kind of hard to really grasp what that really means for you and me and so that conversation is definitely taken leaps and bounds over the last few years we saw other events that, you know, we could fill this program with for a few hours, irrespective of the heat dome, the fires and, and the flooding. And, you know, we, we even saw a tornado at the wrong time of year, one that just was an atmospheric error, if you will, on UBC campus in Vancouver. We've just haven't seen one in 45 years and certainly never in November. So there are so many other things that are starting to happen. Those extremes are starting to pop up. Uh, we have to be careful not to attribute every last possible change that we see as being 100% related to climate change, but at the same time, it's so present that it's impossible to ignore, not just from a scientific point of view, but from, a, from anybody just walking down the street and seeing that things have changed, they're no longer what they used to be, and they're mostly going in one direction at least for a few decades before, as a society, as a global community, we get our acts together. Okay, so I just want to say a massive thank you to Armel Castellan, who's been our guest today, for his time and insight. Thank you so much, Armel.
And if any of our listeners want to follow along with what the Environment Canada are doing on this topic, you can follow them on their Twitter handle, which is at ECCC Weather BC. Lots of C's in there. We'll put it in the notes. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's always wonderful to speak with you guys. I appreciate it. Well, thanks very much for listening to Mostly Climate. The producers today were Claire Nazir and Graham Madge, and the editor was Adrian Holloway. Mostly Climate is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.